right, Damon Johnson from Monroe to Geraldine to your radio. Chinatown, Witness, this is quite wordy, I saw. Delta Rebels, Brother K, and Alice Cooper, Damn Yankees, Red Halo, Slain to the System, John Waite, Whiskey Falls, whose guitar picks I noticed you're using at night because you probably ran out. I did. <laughs> Uh, Alice Cooper again, Thin Lizzy, and now Black Star Riders. Yeah, man. You have started from humble beginnings, but um, played with Alice Cooper big time names like Brian Downey, Steve Gorham, Scotty Warner. Uh, shared the stage with the Stones, Jimmy Page, Van Halen, Robert Plant, Skinner, Waddy Watch. Well, that's just to name a few. Wow, all true. <laughs> All I know through. I know Thin Lizzy was your first concert ever. And you have co penned the songs with the likes of even more Faith Hill, Sammy Hagar. Sammy Hagar. Yeah. And um, Skid Row, Ted Nugent, John Waite, Santana. Musically, um, what can't you do? Uh, which brings us back to Black Star Riders and your new disc, All Hell's Breaking Loose. And uh, You'll be here to tell us about Thin Lizzy, transforming the new outfit, and why the band are bound for glory. <laughs> How was that for it? Nicely done. Alex. All right, so you and I go back further than either of us are willing to admit. <laughs> oh, shit, I'll admit it, bro. 1988, it was a crazy thing, man. It was 26 years ago. 26. Stop. Dude, I got kids. Almost there. Yeah, I think we looked like it too. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. Okay, so thanks for doing this, of course. My pleasure, bro. Like Thank, you. Thank you. So now tell me who's in Black Star Riders. Black Star Riders is Ricky Ward on vocals, Jimmy DeGrasso on drums, myself on guitar, Marco Mendoza on the bass, and the legend Scott Gorham from the original Pivot. And uh, all of us, with the exception of Jimmy, have been in the most recent version of Thin Lizzy uh, that has been touring over the last uh, three or four years, up until we released the Black Star Riders album. And the main difference would be no keyboards. Well, yeah, no keyboards, and of course Jimmy on the drums as opposed to Brian. And the great thing, you know, is that Jimmy's such a fan of Brian. Uh, much like I've been a Lizzy fan my whole career, uh, Jimmy has been as well. And he just brings a lot of that respect, as well as the technical ability, uh, you know, to the table. And it's, it's really incredible, man, that Scott especially loves playing with Jimmy so much. You know, Scott's worked some great drummers to me. You know, there was a version of Lizzy that had Tommy Alder join for a while, legend. Michael Lee, the late, great Michael Lee, amazing drummer. And uh, so Jimmy's just, you know, it, it, it took me five seconds. They said, we need a new drummer. I said, we're calling Jimmy DeGrasse. And everybody's like, what? We can get Jimmy? I'm like, yeah, we'll get Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a good band. It's definitely so good band. now Marco's leaving the band in well, two and a half shows at one point. But yeah, two shows. We're at two. Yeah, man. Um, why is that? Well, Marco's got a lot of, you know, man, Marco's a world-class player world class. Uh, all of us in the musician side of this thing are fully aware of Marco's abilities. Uh, you know, he's more than just a rock and roll bass player. He's a, he's a great singer, he's a great writer, uh, deep musical ability man that gets over into jazz and fusion and I just, I know that Marco's at a place in his life where he wants to do some other things. For us to try and educate the world about the Black Star Riders, you got to commit to it full time. And it's not easy, you know, uh, especially when you've got a band of guys that are each, you know, kind of a pro on their own right. And the phone rings and you have these other opportunities. And Parker's got a lot of cool stuff uh, in the yeah, movies and things that he wants to do. And uh, his moving on is, is all I love. Man. I love that guy. We, we all love him and we wish him the best. And, uh, he's made the transition with Robbie come on, you know, so seamless. We've been having all the rehearsals and sound check every day and all the day and answering the questions Robbie's got. Right. So uh, he's been he's been the Yeah, I saw Robbie hanging out and I didn't know he was at the show the other night. Yeah. So how did you guys settle on Marco or how did you find Marco? You mean Robbie? 
Robbie. Robbie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Jimmy had actually played a couple times with Robbie. I was, I'd met Robbie and knew Robbie, and Robbie has a flawless reputation in the business, man, of just being a great player and a great guy. And, you know, man, at this point for us, being able to, to, to travel and be around somebody you dig is really every bit as important as the playing ability. So, uh, you know what I gotta say, man, Robbie came in and just crushed the audition. I mean, he crushed it. You know, we, we gave him a couple of Black Star Rider songs to learn, a couple of music to him. And he killed it. He just did a great job. He's got such a great heart and great attitude. And, uh, I mean, he's been with us now for uh, three, the last three days on the road. And I, my jaw is hurting from laughing so much. I mean, that guy, is, he's got so many great stories. And it's just good energy. So we feel really lucky, really fortunate to, you know, if we're, we're going to have to move on from such a great player as Marco, it's great to have a killer guy. Right. I noticed during the show that um, I've never seen a drummer as happy as Jimmy the whole time. <laughs> I mean, no matter what the song, he's got a big shitty and grin on his face. Well, Jimmy loves his band. Uh, as we all do. I mean, this is the band. This is the band I wanted to be in when I first met you. Man. I wanted to be in a band like this. And you know, it took me, you know, over two decades to, to finally arrive at something like this, an opportunity. Like this. So um, we all kind of have that. We have that camaraderie, and we have that belief in what we're doing. And, you know, man, we're realistic about what's going on, about what our potential is. Um, you know, we're just trying to spread the word in America. We got a lot of great dates coming up in Europe. So I think that's part of Jimmy's, you know, it comes across. I, I've noticed it too. He, he, didn't, he wasn't smiling like that in Megadeth, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well now, I mean, it's harder and harder to break an act to begin with. Yeah. Thin Lizzy does not really have a, had ever a stellar record in the year. So no. that's kind of amazing. Those is hard. It's hard, man. You know, um, I've said it for a long time. I mean, Thin Lizzy never was a big band in America, so that's going to make it even tougher for a Thin Lizzy in the offshoot UK. band. Yeah, huge in the UK. I mean, Thin Lizzy is almost like the Aerosmith of, of the UK. You know, um, they're just a big, uh, you know, English band. You know, Dublin and. and they lived in the UK back in the day and uh, the original, original lineup. So, um, yeah, and you know, of all the things that have happened over the last year, I think the thing that we as a band are the most grateful for is how the Thin Lizzy fan base has embraced the Black Star Riders album. Um, which, you know, we didn't take that for today. It brings me back to Black Star Riders. Tell me how the second new band came about. <laughs> And, um, I mean, a track from, like, Bound for Glory could be a Thin Lizzy song. I mean, where do you draw the line, and how did you decipher a, a sound for this song? Well, um, I think, particularly for Ricky and myself, who have really studied that Thin Lizzy stuff for, for you know, our whole adult lives, really. Um, we 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 felt equal parts excitement and equal parts fear, you know. When Scott and Brian Downey said we really want to pursue the possibility of making a new album, because any classic band that's still out there doing it, you know, they're putting out new music. Even bands that have different members, you know, uh, you want to express yourself, you want to grow as a player and as a band, you want to give the fans some new music to listen to. Like, hey, look, this is who it is and what it is. At this point in history, this is what it sounds like. And um, so, for me, it was like, well, I get to be as thin Lizzy as I ever wanted to be. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be on a thin Lizzy record. And there's an element of that, as far as the writing part, that was really easy. It was so easy, I mean, you know, I've been ripping off Thin Lizzy my whole career, dude. <laughs> and trying to like cleverly disguise it. Now I don't have to hide it anymore. So I know that 
the first batch of songs that Ricky and I wrote together, we were definitely a little nervous to play it for Scott, because we, we were like, well, if Scott doesn't dig it, then we'll go back to the drawing board. And the amazing news is that he loved it. Right. So we knew we were on, on the right track. Okay, now, uh, how do you decide when doing a track who leads? Who plays the, the solo? The lead guitar, yeah. Um, How's that handled? You know what I mean? Really, most of it doesn't really have a lead. You guys share so much. So. Well, there's, there's definitely a lot of that classic Lizzie Harmony thing, but you know, it's interesting. It's not like we said, okay, when it comes to the solos, this is what we're going to do. It just sort of morphed. And, you know, man, Scott, I, I'm so honored to say that Scott is one of my biggest fans. You know, he, he loves how I play, he loves the ideas I uh, bring in creatively. Yeah, he was really enjoying and, and he, he wants me to, like, he wants me right out there in the front, you know, in the spotlight, hanging out. And uh, so, yeah, you know, it's really strange when it came time to do the solo for Bound for Glory, I just, uh, I went into it. And he was like, yeah, go, man, that sounds great. And it was the same with when he did the solo on All Hell Breaks Loose. Um, like you said, there's a lot of harm. Uh, you know, Kingdom of the Lost, that was a song Ricky and I had written. It's probably the song I'm my, most proud of. Yeah. And I knew I wanted us to do the harmony thing together. And then when it came time to have sort of a solo bit, you know, I wanted Scott to play. Uh, you know, my song, I was like, Oh man, I want Scott Gorham playing on this song. <laughs> and so, you know, we, 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 we have a great, we have a great exchange, a great rapport. And uh, I got feelings in all these people. So, you were talking about having Robbie a sound check. Now, does he give the band a different sound at all? You know what, actually, Robbie does. Robbie does. He, he um, you know, just the way he strikes the, the string with his pick is a little differently. His tone is a little different. It's a little brownier, it's a little, a little deeper, a little lower. Um, and uh, I, I just think it's, I think it's, um, it's a lot of, for lack of a better word, it's fun. It's fun for us to have that new energy in there. And now we can kind of shake it up a little bit and get our head in there. You know, we're going to go to Europe a couple of days early, and so we'll rehearse a full set. And, and Robbie will have his gear, his bass, his stuff. So uh, it's going to be cool. So, um, Kevin Shirley, how did you get him to produce? Was he excited about her? Did he have to twist his arm? No, man, oh. Kevin was excited. You know, man, he's a classic rocker, just like us, man. Like you and me. He's a big fan. And, um... I'm trying to remember who reached out to Kevin first. Uh, maybe it was our, our Aorga Monty Connor. He But uh, I, I communicated with Kevin. And um, you know, he told me straight out, he goes, man, I love all that Lizzie stuff. And he, we had sent him some of the songs. And that was the, that was the big difference we had right there. I, what did he think about the songs? And he loved them. So you know, for him to express that kind of excitement as well, it just reinforced that we were on the right track. So, uh, yeah, man, he heard the demos and he said, yeah, I'd love to be involved. Awesome. Now, a tad of history. Somewhere on the road with Alice Cooper, I do believe it was the Count Basie Theater, maybe? Um, you said you were thinking of leaving Alice, and then you said you would really wanted to go home and spend more time with your family. Now, did Scott make you an offer you couldn't refuse? And did you <laughs> see that first show and that you know brass ring that you've always wanted? Well, it's funny that you ask that question and you frame it in what we had talked about about who you know not want to be going from home so much. It was literally my wife, Linda, that convinced me to take the Thin Lizzy opportunity because um, Alice is my brother. I love that guy. I love his whole family. I love the whole family. It's just a great group of people. And uh, I just didn't feel good about leaving him and, and, and moving on. Because you know? really, we were in the middle of a tour. You know, this was like August of 2011. It was my wife, she said, Damon, all she said the first time we ever met, we talked about films. You know, 
she goes, she goes, if you, would, if you don't at least give this a shot, try it out. She goes, you do. She was right. And Alice said the same thing. You know, Alice was my, he was my biggest supporter. He said, hey man, I get it. I totally get it. It didn't really happen for me. And they were, he, he and Chef and everybody was really accommodating and helping me. Did you see Chef on TV now? Yeah. This Chef's everywhere right now. I know, right? So now, uh, you replaced Richard Fortas from Guns N' Roses, who replaced Vivian Campbell, uh, Def Leppard, and um, had you seen Thin Lizzy live with those guys, and how was their guitar work different than what you were doing? No, I, well, I did see them. Ironically, there was a... The concert bill of all places in Dublin. Def Leppard, Alice Cooper, Thin Lizzy. Wow. And uh, I was so stoked to to see Lizzy and to see Scott again. Scott and I had actually met back in 2006, and it kind of stayed in touch just via email, that kind of thing, because he lives in London. Um, and I knew that they had this new lineup, you know, so I was really curious to see it. And I, I literally stood out in the crowd like a hunter. You know, I'm just out there right in the middle of the crowd watching. And it was killing. And, and uh, Ricky blew me away. Like, I, I was aware of who Ricky was, but I wasn't familiar with his whole delivery. You didn't have any idea. I didn't at the time. I didn't at the time. So, um, we did a second show. And uh, we played Belfast and we played Dublin. And after that second show is when I heard rumblings that Richard was going to have to go back to London. And that was sort of how the conversation got started. Richard's an amazing player and such a sweet, sweet cat. You know, he was so helpful for me. Um, you know, when I came in and showed me some parts and um, monster player. You know. And, uh, they sounded great with Vivian, and they sounded great with Richard. And I think, look, man, we, you know, between the three of us, it's like you're, the common denominator is we all love and respect Thin Lizzy so much. We respect that music, those songs, those people. And uh, so, yeah, I just, I guess I was at the right place. I remember asking Vivian what he thought of your playing. And he was like, uh, I don't know, who is he? And I email you and you're like, that's perfect. Yeah, that's that is perfect. perfect. That is perfect. <laughs> so now, you guys do a lot of huge festivals. I mean, massive crowds. Mm. Hey, what is it like to stand on one of those stages like that with that many people? And two, is it a letdown to play like a club like this from that, like right after? Well, it's an amazing feeling to play those big audiences. It's a different kind of performance setting. Um, yeah, everything's bigger and it's more about you really are putting on your entertainer hat more there. And you know, it's about making more sweeping gestures and you know, working the stage and, and that kind of thing. But it's a blast. Oh man, it's such a blast to play those big rooms. I, I still get butterflies. Not not like nervous butterflies, but just excitement butterflies. You know, they start the intro and then we come around the back of the amps and out on the stage and it's like, Ugh. and you know, it's my band now. You know, it's my band. It's not Alice's band. It's my band. It's exciting, man. And that's that's the that's the, the way we all feel about Black So Right. So, um, but the thing that's amazing you know, that we love about this run that we're doing in the stage, you know, it's like we're being musicians, you know. We get we can be nice and tight and, you know, change the set list up a little bit and really hear each other and, and uh, I mean you saw it today. Man yeah. is on fire. Just super tough. So you can't do um, what, like when you play the big places you keep the set list the same? A lot of times we tend to keep it fairly consistent. Because yeah. um, you're on the time on it. Yeah you just want to know exactly kind of the length of the set and you want to just make it to where you really give it a great performance. It is a little more of a production because we got lighting guys out, we got more crew guys out. Um, it's more stuff. You know, we got risers and ramps and you know, all that shit we talked about in 1988. Was <laughs> <laughs> As witness played for three people. Yeah, literally three people. Yeah, man. I remember Debbie Davis saying, well, 
least Arista and us have sold one album to Alex who came out. <laughs> and I'm sitting on a stool by myself in this middle of this empty room. Yeah. And I said, well, actually, uh, I got it for free. I got it for free, so, so I didn't have to pay for it. So now, whose idea was the name and the logo? The name was Ricky's. Ricky came up with Black Star Riders. Um, and the original email that he sent, which I have saved somewhere, it was the name that I hated the least, you know. And we all felt that way. It's like naming a band is such a yeah. it's such a pain in the ass, especially after all these years. So it just kind of jumped off the page. And Ricky was really thoughtful yeah. about it. You know, he says, "Man, I just see it as like this cool kind of gang vibe." And um, and we had a we had a guy that's a friend of our manager's that started working on some logo ideas. And as soon as he came up with that kind of winged fighter, pilot vibe, we just, everybody, we're like, yeah, that's kind of cool. And now, man, it's more Buzz is a block away! It's, it's morphed into this great thing, you know, where it goes into this great yeah. shirts, it was great on the album. Yeah, I'm clear um, these yeah, man, it's a lot of fun to be a part of so. Let's move to the second. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's just killing it.